This is Eleanor Holmes Norton, the delegate at large from Washington, D.C. In 2019, she introduced House Resolution 51, which, if made into law, would make Washington, D.C. the 51st state. But can it become a state? And more importantly, should it? Before we attempt to answer these questions, let's go back into history a little bit. Near the end of the Revolutionary War, Congress and the executive branch of the Pennsylvania state government were located in Philadelphia at the Pennsylvania State House, which is known today as Independence Hall. In June 1783, the State House was mobbed by as many as 400 soldiers demanding payment for their service in the Revolutionary War. This event is known as the Pennsylvania Mutiny of 1783. So members of Congress asked the Pennsylvania State Government for help to protect Congress from the mutineers. And since Pennsylvania refused and wouldn't assure Congress adequate protection in the future, Congress was forced to move to Nassau Hall in Princeton, New Jersey. Because of Pennsylvania's failure to protect Congress, the framers decided that they would create a federal district distinct from the states where Congress would not only provide for its own security, but also not need to rely on a state government for its day-to-day -day operations. So land was donated from Maryland and Virginia to form this 10-mile square federal district. Eventually, Virginia demanded their portion of donated land be given back to them, and that portion of the district was retroceded. Long story short, this area is controlled by the federal government, and with the District of Columbia Organic Act of 1801, the district's residents lost voting representation in Congress, being able to vote for president or take part in the constitutional amendment process. But that changed slightly in 1961 with the 23rd Amendment. It gave district residents the right to vote in presidential elections and along with it, electoral votes. And in 1970, President Nixon signed the District of Columbia Delegate Act, which gave the district a non-voting delegate to Congress. And currently, that delegate is Eleanor Holmes Norton. Representative Norton can't vote on legislation, but she can serve on congressional committees, debate on the House floor, and of course, introduce legislation. Since her first term in 1991, Norton has been introducing bills like H.R. 51, the intent of which is to grant Washington, D.C. statehood and admit it into the Union, making it the 51st state. Back in the 1990s, this new state would have been called New Columbia. The federal district, which would still be called Washington, D.C., would then be shrunk down to this small portion of land, which would include the White House, the National Mall, the Capitol Building, Senate and Congressional offices, and two military bases. In 1993, H.R. 51 received a floor vote in the House, and it failed 153 to 277. And I know what you're probably thinking, those damn Republicans. Oh wait, 105 Democrats voted against statehood, how about that? Anyway, at the beginning of the 116th Congress, Norton announced that she again was introducing H.R. 51. I introduced my first bill of the session. H.R. 51, I reserved that number 51 early on. <laughs> <laughs> this time, the proposed state wouldn't be called New Columbia, it would be called Washington Douglas Commonwealth, which would pay homage to DC resident Frederick Douglass and allow the state to still go by Washington, DC. And unlike the New Columbia proposal, the federal district would be shrunk down to this tiny sliver of land Okay, so now that we're caught up with some of the basic history, let's explore some of the arguments for and against D.C. statehood. The capital city has 702,000 residents, more than Vermont or Wyoming. But the population is large in Washington, D.C. because it's the nation's seat of government. In fact, by 2018 estimates, nearly 28% of all D.C. residents work for the federal government. And you have to believe that there are at least twice as many lobbyists. It also affects pandemic response. In the CARES Act offering relief, Congress sent D.C. $750 million less than it gave to states. Congress passed a coronavirus relief bill, giving each state at least a billion dollars. But D.C., which is usually treated like a state in most congressional funding, was instead treated as a U.S. territory and got less than half that. So what? The minimum that each state was guaranteed in coronavirus relief was $1.25 billion. Washington, D.C. is the size of a city, not only in population, but also in landmass. So why would it need as much as a state? The answer, it doesn't. 
and people here pay more total federal taxes than 22 states. That's because people make more money in D.C. And when you make more money, you pay more in taxes. Although the district is not a state and does not see representation in Congress, its residents pay the sixth highest individual income tax rate in the U.S. The reason taxes are so high in Washington, D.C. is because the district's income tax rate is so high. And that's not the federal government's fault. Besides, I thought Democrats liked paying their fair share of taxes, so I don't know why they're complaining. Washington, D.C.'s unofficial motto is taxation without representation. This is referring to the fact that the district doesn't have voting representation in Congress. But making the district a state would give Washington, D.C. not only one congressperson, but also two senators. And since the district is historically Democrat, this would pretty much guarantee that all three would be Democrats. And this by far is the biggest reason for Democrats to support H.R. 51, so that they can stack the deck. Just ask Senator Lindsey Graham. The Democratic Party is changing this construct to get two more seats in the Senate. If you don't see that, you really are blind, politically. <laughs> but Democrats, like Washington, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser, disagree. So we know that statehood is the only way to ensure that we have full res representation, that we have votes here in the United States of America in the Capitol. And that's what the Democrats would like you to think, but there is another way. Instead of making the district a state, the residential portion of DC could be retroceded back to Maryland. DC would then become a city within Maryland, and then residents would have voting representation in the House and the Senate. Senator Tom Cotton explains. They would have representation in the House. In fact, it would probably be their own congressman, because it's about the size of a congressional district these days. They would be represented by two Democratic senators, Ben Cardin and Chris Van Hollen. They want two seats in perpetuity in the United States Senate, because they can't win a majority here by the ordinary rules of the road in every election. With that said, on June 16th, Democrats held a press conference to speak about their intent to vote on H.R. 51. First, here's House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer. I have been a strong supporter and I'm a strong supporter of D.C. statehood. You hear that, everyone? Majority Leader Hoyer is a strong supporter of D.C. statehood, even when he was voting against it. For more than two centuries, the residents of Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia, have been denied their right to fully participate in their democracy. Except if D.C. residents were so worried about their democracy, then why do only 60% of registered voters turn out to the polls in presidential elections? And according to the Washington Post, in 2018, overall turnout for the district's mayoral primaries was a dismal 18%. And that's very low, considering that the city is filled with bureaucrats and federal employees, so give me a break about residents being denied their democratic rights, Nancy. Anyway, on June 26th, the House of Representatives voted on H.R. 51. There being 232 votes in the affirmative, 180 votes in the negative, the District of Columbia Statehood Bill H.R. 51 is passed without objection. Motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. So while the House passed the bill 232 to 180, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is unlikely to waste his time bringing the statehood bill to the floor of the Senate. And even if he did, the bill wouldn't receive the 60 votes required for passage anyway. And in the unlikely event that the bill reached his desk, President Trump has promised that he would veto it. Right now, the people in charge of the federal government oppose DC statehood, but it only takes one election to change that. And <laughs> not so fast, Vox.com. Even if Congress and the president were in favor of statehood for DC, there would be some issues. First, remember that Washington, D.C. sits on land that was donated by Maryland to be used specifically for the federal district. Maryland did not donate their land so that it could become a future state, so Maryland would have the right to demand that that land be given back to them. And that way, they can enjoy all that sweet, sweet income tax revenue from Washington, D.C. residents. However, even if Maryland didn't want the land back, there would still be some constitutional issues. Back in 1961, the District of Columbia was awarded electoral votes thanks to the 23rd Amendment. 
If DC becomes the Washington Douglas Commonwealth, it would be entitled to three electoral votes. And that means that this sliver of land, which would be what's left of Washington DC, would also be constitutionally entitled to three electoral votes. That means that President Trump and First Lady Melania Trump could change their residence from Florida to Washington DC and have their own electoral votes. The Democrats know this and are like, well, we'll make DC a state and worry about that constitutional thingy later. Then there's Article 1, Section 8, which states that Congress shall have power to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district. While Congress does have the authority over the district, that doesn't mean that they can enlarge or decrease its size for political purposes, but they're going to make that argument anyway. The, the question was asked, can the, this Congress make the federal enclave smaller? And clearly, the, the framers had every opportunity to, uh, to um, describe a minimum size for the federal enclave. They didn't. They described a maximum size. In other words, the framers said that the district shall not exceed 10 miles square. But they didn't specify a minimum size, so we can just shrink it down as small as we want. Seriously, that's their justification. However, Washington DC was meant to be a city. This is not a city. This is barely a theme park. Under HR 51, the federal government would be entirely dependent upon the new state of Washington DC for water, for utilities, for infrastructure, communications, even police and fire services. By virtue of this relationship, this new state would have incredible power over the other states. The government of the most powerful nation in the world wouldn't have control of critical infrastructure necessary for its own safety, functioning, and independence in a crisis. And by shrinking DC into what essentially would be a small enclave within the state, our nation's capital could not function as a self-contained entity, which was the entire point of establishing the district in the first place. The federal government's safety and independence cannot be assured by such a laughable district. Again, look at it. It's got 90 sides. So for now, the passage of HR 51 in the House is more symbolic than anything, but don't underestimate the Democrats. If they retain their majority in the House and somehow take back the Senate, they have a shot at eventually pushing this BS forward, especially if Senate Democrats succeed in getting rid of the filibuster. And former Vice President Joe Biden has expressed his support for statehood. And if he wins in November, he has promised to sign HR 51 if it comes to his desk. As if you needed any more reasons to register to vote this year. Anyway, that's it for now. And thanks for watching, sharing, and hitting that like button. Again, a big special thanks to Poofy for her help on the script this week. And be sure to follow her on Twitter and Parlor at St. Sundale. And follow me on both platforms at Don't Walk Run. And be sure you're still subscribed to the channel. <laughs> uh, as always, I hope to see you all next time.